Welcome everyone to a special welcome everyone to a special health talk. We're gonna be talking about a clinical trial that's gonna be coming on board soon. And uh, so I want to go over a couple of Zoom instructions with you. Um, top right corner, there's a view button. You see the view button, you see gallery speaker, and you can uh, even blur yourself out if you want. But if you want to see the speaker, which is what I recommend, hit the speaker. The bottom right corner is mute. Please do not unmute yourself. We're going to do all the questions through chat. So you're going to go ahead and hit the chat button. You can type into your question. Uh, Dr. Krillin does have some slides, so he'll be going through those. And uh, I just want to mention one thing that uh, is a, a couple things that are important. The first thing is that uh, all the ALK talk information is going to be soon on our website, alkpositive.org. So our calendars and our direct links and all of our classes and everything that we offer during the week, you can get it directly from that website and that will go live in hopefully two weeks. And uh, the other thing is too, there's a petition that's being passed around and you should go, I mean, put it into, into the chat. It's lungcan.org forward slash act, A-C-T. And it's an ask for $60 million of research dollars to go to lung cancer research. So that's very important. I'm gonna introduce Summer Farman. She's my partner in crime. And uh, I know where you are, Summer. Yeah. You can unmute and say hello. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. We weren't sure uh, on a nice, warm April evening what our attendance would be like, but thank you all so much for coming. We have a very exciting topic tonight on cellular therapy, which is kind of new to me, but my dad, who's been in the field for years, is super excited about it, so that makes me excited about it. He tells me I like it, I like it. <laughs> so uh, go ahead, Mark, take it away. All right, so the new pre just came in. Please mute yourself bottom left corner. I'm going to uh, go ahead and launch a couple polls just to get everyone in the mindset. So okay. the first one is, uh, please mute yourself, please. Uh, what type of treatment are you taking currently? Single choice question. This will also give Dr. Creel an opportunity to know who's in our audience as we have so far 110 people uh, in our Zoom room, which is incredible. And I want to thank Dr. Krillin for, for giving us the opportunity to talk to him on a Sunday. No, I'm not supposed to answer this, right? Um, no, unless you're taking a TKI okay. <laughs> or other therapies. Okay, so I'm going to basically uh, announce this for the recording. And the number one answer is electinib at 67%. Then we have lorlatinib at 12% and brigatinib at 10%. And I'm going to stop sharing that poll. And I'm going to go into our another poll, which is our second question is, give me your length of diagnosis. How long since you've been diagnosed? And my assumption, since you guys are in electinib, most of you, that it's going to be a shorter duration. But I'm going to end this poll and share the results. And leading the pack is one to two years at 35%, three to four years at 26%, one and under at 19%, and five to six at 11%, and seven to eight at 3%, and more than eight is 6%. I am more than eight, so I would have added someone to that. <laughs> one, one more. Uh, then next, uh, oh, okay, we're gonna launch this one. Have you ever participated in a clinical trial? And this is no shocker either. And I'm gonna end this poll, share the results. 85% of us have never been in a trial. 15% of us have been in a trial. And the last question is, since we're here for this question, I wanna launch this poll. And what is the abbreviation for TILT? I hope Dr. Killen gets this right. Wow, you guys are pretty smart. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna close this and share it. All right, 52% oh, wow. of us, is, was that right? 
Dr. Creon, 52%. That's pretty impressive. Of, all right, so 52% of wow. us got tumor I, infiltrating lymphocytes. I can probably go just go home at this point. <laughs> okay. Wait, I am home. Never mind. <laughs> That's true. Uh, hopefully you're dressed, though. Um, no <laughs> idea why you're here. It's 30, 30%. So we're going to learn, and uh, I'm going to pass it off uh, to Summer, who's going to introduce our moderator. Our moderator this evening <laughs> um, chairs the Research Acceleration Committee. Um, we are very lucky, lucky to have her with us. She is a care partner or caregiver to Ricardo, um, or as Colin has introduced um, her to me as Ricardo's boss. Um, but Carla Voss and Ricardo worked together to bring Dr. Creelan to us, and we are so grateful. We have been waiting and counting down the days for this. So thank you so much. Um, Carla, go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, so my name is Carla Voss, uh, also known as Ricardo's boss. <laughs> uh, would, he, he's my husband. Um, but, but thanks, guys, so much for joining this evening. Um, and so I became a, care, a caregiver to my husband, Ricardo, who was diagnosed in October of 2020 with uh, stage four uh, alpha positive lung cancer. And, you know, I think many of you can, can relate to this, but, you know, initially it's, it's pretty shocking and it can feel, um, you know, it's, it's difficult to sort of find the information that you need. And, you know, we were very fortunate that we sort of quickly connected with the ALK positive organization and, you know, one of the first things that we both did was actually watch all of the recordings of both these, you know, Sunday out talks, um, as well as the annual summit. And, you know, it gave us an incredible amount of information, you know, and very quickly we were sort of able to get up to speed. And, you know, I think it was incredibly helpful to hear from some of the most knowledgeable medical experts uh, in the world on, on ALK uh, through these talks. So I'm thrilled to today be sitting here and actually be able to, um, you know, participate and uh, have a conversation and hear directly from Dr. Ben Creelan, who is, um, you know, and he probably won't say this, but probably, you know, one of the leading uh, clinical experts in cellular therapy uh, for lung cancer. And I'll leave it to him to explain exactly what cellular therapy is. Uh, but, you know, while it's a new form of treatment, I think it, it holds a lot of promise and it's a very interesting, um, you know, area for, for us all to learn about. So um, just a little bit of background on Dr. Creelan. Uh, he is a medical oncologist and clinical research, uh, clinical researcher in the Department of Thoracic Oncology at Moffitt Cancer Center, which is in Florida. And um, at Moffitt, he focuses on translational uh, and clinical research and specifically looks at developing new immune therapies for the treatment of, of uh, lung cancer. So we're, we're super excited. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Freeland, for being here. And uh, we'll turn it over to you to uh, share a little bit more about what you're working on. Well, thanks again for hosting these Sunday workshops because I actually tuned in for Dr. Ooh's presentation, I think back in November. And I think I learned more about ALK uh, in that one session than in the past five years. Um, the truth is that some of the patients who are currently tuned in may know more about ALK lung cancer than many of the medical oncologists in, 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 in the world. So that's really impressive that we have such a critical mass of patients that are able to um, tackle this totally random and um, aggressive type of cancer. So um, let's see. So I believe I am screen sharing. Is that right? Or no? Hold on. Yeah, it's your screen. Okay, great. Well, not anymore. Okay. So. Is that correct? Great. Save that. So can you see my slides? Yep. Yes? Yes. Yep. OK, great. Well, um, again, uh, what we see here is, uh, you know, on behalf of my colleagues, I'm really happy to present on, you know, live cell therapy for lung cancer. This 
picture is actually a photomicrograph of T cells in blue attacking tumor cells in purple. So this is what it actually looks like under the microscope when our own immune cells attack cancer cells. And you can see the cancer cells are a little bigger. They're kind of weird and kind of ugly looking. Um, in this case, these are actually leukemia cells, but tumor cells are, are gonna look fairly kind of similar. Um, and let's see, so, you know, I do need to disclose my conflicts of interest, which is, you know, which companies I've worked with in the last, you know, few years. Um, primarily that's cell therapy companies. And, you know, I do get some research funding to my institution for uh, drugs or clinical trials in cell therapy. So I'm gonna start out with this quick overview, and then I'm gonna go through some examples of cell therapy highlighting lung cancer and some of the trials that we've done. So, and again, please, anyone uh, throw a question in the chat um, and we can go over it once we've, we're done. I'm, uh, I think that's a great way to start. And then we can, if we wanna talk about, um, we do have a more discussion, we, we can do that at, at the end, okay? So what are the different types of cell therapy? Well, um, basically with the, commonly used cell therapy, we're actually taking cells out of your body and then changing them, either activating them or even genetically manipulating them, uh, growing them to large numbers and then giving them back to you. This is called adoptive cell transfer, adoptive cell therapy. And currently there's basically three or four types of doing this. One of them, which 52% of people on the line just got, got correct, is TIL, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, where we cut a tumor out of your body, we culture the T cells from the material, and we um, give those immune cells back to you, okay? But there's also CAR therapy, which is the one down here, and TCR therapy, where we actually introduce a new gene into your own immune cells, and then give you those immune cells back again. And we also have peripheral blood cells, which um, can be useful in that, in that context. So um, some are genetically modified, as you can see, and some of them aren't. But bottom line is that taking cells out of your body and giving them back to you is the most, um, how all this cell therapy generally works. And the key thing is this can take time. One way of thinking of this is that, you know, we have, CARs and TCRs, which are kind of modeled for many different type of patients that targets a specific protein. Whereas we have, you know, more, more personalized methods of growing these cells. This is not something to focus on, but the bottom line is that the more personalized the cell therapy gets, the longer it takes to make it. And so some of these studies take three or four months just to make the cells for the patients, um, which can be a downside uh, in some cases because some patients, hey doc, I can't afford to wait that long. So how does it work? Well, this is the coolest thing of all. All the tumor cells, whether it's uh, leukemia, uh, colon cancer or lung cancer has mutations in it. And our body, should be capable of rejecting those cells, rejecting those tumor cells, because the tumor cells are expressing foreign proteins that have mutations in them. The same way that if I tried to, you know, engraft some of my cells onto Mark, give them to Mark, his body would reject them, you know? Um, the tumor cells should also be rejected by our immune system. And those mutations are key for our immune system to recognize them as foreign. So nonetheless, somehow the tumor cell grows despite that. And it's probably because the T cells are trapped in this suppressive tumor microenvironment around the tumor. So by cutting the tumor out and growing those T cells that are specific for the tumor in a you know, activating media, then we can sometimes see dramatic responses. So um, this is how this works, this tumor infiltrating lymphocyte therapy works. 
Once again, uh, the problem is that everyone's cancer mutations tend to be different. However, the folks on the line now, we all share elk fusion in general. And now there's different types of elk fusions, variant one, variant two, variant three, et cetera. But um, these are universally shared fusion um, mutations. So in theory, you know, a TCR that T cell that targeted an elk could be um, quite uh, it could be used for more than just one patient. But in general, most of the mutations we have are fairly unique. They're not shared. And so, you know, with TIL, these T cells are targeting my passenger, my, my mutations in my tumor, but I have to clear out and make space for the, the T cells. I told you we're getting an army of a billion T cells infused back into us. Well, if I just try to give those T cells without making space for them first, the body will just say, hey, I don't need these. So this is called lymphodepletion chemotherapy. And all forms of adoptive cell therapy generally require this. And so this step one, it takes chemotherapy that's usually given over the course of around three to four days, five days sometimes. And then we can actually give the T cells, the TIL. Um, again, it's important to make space. And then we give that one-time cell therapy. It's not required to give multiple times. And often this is billions of cells. Now we do give this additional thing called IL-2 afterwards, which is a stimulant. It makes patients feel kind of ill, like they're having the flu, because it's the same type of protein that gets cranked up in my body when I'm having the flu. It's intended to stimulate or boost our immune system. So doc, do I really need all this stuff or can I just get the cells? And the truth is no, that you know, there's a relationship between the dose of the chemotherapy and how well patients respond the cell dose, the amount of cells the patients get of their own cells, and even the IL-2. So it's preferred not to try to compromise on these things that we really wanna tilt the scales in our favor as much as possible. So that's how TIL works. Um, once again, the, the advantage of TIL is that you're getting your own native immune cells, no genetic modification, it's not biased, doesn't need any special marker. No markers required, no biomarkers, because it's whatever immune mutations your own T cells decided to recognize. But hey, it's expensive. You know, the, the cost is more than $100,000 per patient. And that's currently just coming out of our research budget because we can't, this is not approved by the FDA yet. So it's all coming through trials. And, you know, there's always the chance that those immune cells that you culture just plain don't recognize the tumor, right? Because we can't guarantee that when we're, when we're growing them. So this is the real hallmark of TIL, this memory T cell. So a, a regular old immune cell T cell in, in my body will only last seven to 10 days and then it's gone. So if you had COVID-19, you had those COVID-19 anti T cells, they, they stuck around for maybe seven to 10 days and then they died. But a subset of them, and just like a subset of the TIL, will turn into memory T cells, and they will stick around for 60 to 70 years. And that's why it's uncommon for people to get COVID-19 twice. The same thing's true with TIL. Um, if you can get a good response, these responses can last for decades. And this is shown in from melanoma, because the data for lung cancer, we just did the trial a few years ago, so we don't really know about that. However, um, and I'll skip through this part, the bottom line is that immunotherapy naive tumors like um, immune checkpoint proteins like Opdivo, Keytruda, probably aren't, uh, it, the, the T cells harvested in after Keytruda or Opdivo tend to be more tired, tend to be more exhausted as opposed to ones that haven't seen that drug before. So I, it seems like patients who, have had their TIL treatment, or, or at least their TIL removed, before Keytruda or Opdivo seem to have better TIL because they're less exhausted. And I'm gonna skip through this part and talk about our lung cancer experience. So busy slide here. Um, I think the bottom line is that, you know, we 
decided to do this first in human or first in lung cancer trial. We took the success from melanoma. We said, hey, this works in melanoma. We're seeing response rates around, you know, 30, 40%. Let's see if it works in lung cancer. So we, you know, took stage four patients um, with lung cancer and we removed a tumor and harvested and made till at our own cell therapy facility at Moffitt. That's one great thing about Moffitt is we have our own facility. We treated them with Opdivo, just plain Opdivo for four doses. And if they were having some clinical improvement in their tumor lesions, uh, we just kept them on the Opdivo. But if they were not, then we went ahead and had them receive that lymphodepletion chemotherapy over five days, and then the T cells, and then the IL-2. And I think the surprising thing from this was that several patients had um, responses, including two complete responses, and some patients who just didn't have measurable disease, but are still in remission. So uh, this is kind of a busy slide. I'm sorry, I'm not, uh, uh, you know, I'll highlight that there's two EGFR mutant patients here who, again, don't usually respond to immunotherapy uh, that did quite well. And also um, some other types of oncogenes. So again, the uh, overall survival for this general patient population, it's, you know, over 50% going out to two or three years here. So Really what we were trying to understand with this is, does TIL play by the same rules as Keytruda or Opdivo? And the fact is it doesn't. Tumor mutation burden doesn't seem to make any difference. Smoking history, PDL1, all these typical biomarkers did not seem to make a difference when the chances of, as far as the chances of TIL response. So this was pretty encouraging. And as I'll show in a moment, we have a new clinical trial that we're currently launching using Keytruda in combination with the TIL. So we also like to, Chow is a great guy. He's amazing. He's a superstar. He's in our lab. And he went back and tried to discover what mutations in our tumor, in, our, in the tumor of the patient, the T cells are actually recognizing. And I think the bottom line is that if you do have mutations that are recognized by the TIL, then you do have a better chance of responding. Now I'm gonna highlight two patient cases. Deborah um, had a um, uh, progression on the Opdivo and she had subsequently a complete response to the TIL, which persists to this day. I just saw her two weeks ago and her CEA level is undetectable. She has no, um, no evidence of disease and she is doing um, scuba diving, uh, underwater photography. So I'm always excited to you know, check up on her and I always keep my fingers crossed on every CT scan, but so far now going out, what is it? Um, four years, uh, she's been uh, in remission. Another patient, uh, Sherry, is a never smoker with EGFR exon 19, and she's had this complete response as well. And interestingly, her tumors, her T cells recognized these unique proteins in her tumor called MAGE, which is like a aberrant protein. So I think what really shocked me was that her cancer was progressing quickly through Opdivo, as you might expect in a never smoker. And I was really worried about actually even treating her. But, and when I started seeing the reports coming back with the CT scans, I could barely even, I couldn't even, I was like, is this for real? Is it just chemotherapy effect? But it, you know, it translated into this complete response. And I see her, you know, periodically, she, she travels between uh, the North and, and down here. So that again has prompted us to do this new trial looking specifically at you know, oncogene-driven lung cancer, where we treat with Keytruda for just two doses. And if patients aren't responding, then they immediately go to the Cyflu, TIL, and IL-2. And um, 
we hope to have this trial open in about four or five months. So we're also um, looking at what makes it because we saw in that in that study that I, we did last year that you know not all patients respond. So we're currently trying to do research as well about what makes one patient respond and another one not. And we think, as you'll hear this at every meeting, it's often all about the tumor microenvironment, you know, the area that the tumors throw up, the fences, the bunkers, the um, barbed wire that tumors put up around them that prevent our soldiers, our army, from getting in there and doing their job. And I'm going to skip through some of these slides. So sorry if it's a bit slow. Here's an, I'm sorry. Here's an example of another patient, never smoker, EGFR mutation, who had a uh, fairly good response to the TIL, but she had a new tumor occur a year later. And I think you all will agree that in patients who are having a good response, feeling great, who have just one new lesion, a year into treatment, what do you do? You cut it out, right? So we, we did surgery, we removed it, and she still remains in remission to this day. But the great thing about that is we were able to sequence her tumor very deeply. And we found that those original proteins that the TIL targeted were gone, as you might expect. So the same way that you see genomic evolution of fitness pressure with the ELK, pills that were many of us are on, we see the same thing going on with TIL, only on an immune basis, only on looking at immune pressures. So that's really um, uh, fascinating, and we're planning on publishing this soon. And indeed, if we look at a lot of other patients from this trial, we see a similar trend that those originally targeted neoantigens abnormal proteins are missing from the progressive tumor. So this really shows you know, how the mechanism of action of how this, how this type of treatment works. And I'm not going to go too far into details here, except that um, sometimes the T cells just don't persist for very long. That's the other problem is that you know, those immune cells, they have to turn into memory cells, remember, Otherwise, the responses may only last for months rather than years. And that's what happened um, in some of the patient cases. So um, now I'm gonna go talk about a different trial that was reported at SITC, Society of Immunotherapy Consortium in November. And this was just enrolling all lung cancers that had had at least two or three prior lines of therapy. And there were responses seen. However, um, maybe not quite as many responses as the patients who had uh, not received a previous Keytruda or Opdivo. Um, and so to me, uh, this trial was a lesson learned that if one is going to go for TIL, you might want to try to get that tumor cut out and saved before you go on to get Keytruda or Opdivo because the response rates may be less or the response duration may not be quite as long. Interestingly, we, like, you, like you might expect, if we harvest till from you know, patients that haven't had that Keytruda or which is pembrolizumab or Opdivo, nivolumab, Infinzi, Dervolumab, regardless of the cancer type, whether it's melanoma, head, neck cancer, cervical cancer, et cetera, you know, the response rates tend to be much higher. So to me, that's, um, that's a lesson, again, that, uh, again, that you don't wanna beat those poor T cells to death with an uh, antibody drug um, before you actually go for some of these types of treatment. And as, um, this is just a few examples of some other sponsored trials that are currently going on in lung cancer. Um, anybody who's interested, please reach out and I can, potentially connect you with for some of these trials, although some of them are actively excluding, as we see, EGFR or ALK patients, which is frustrating. Um, another approach, really quick, is to just um, treat with 
uh, a very, you know, try to figure out what mutations are in your tumor and try to stimulate those T cells to recognize or enrich for T cells that recognize those mutations. This takes months, remember, four months sometimes. But in theory, you will have a more enriched immune cell product to get infused back to you. So um, there's several of these types of trials going on. Here's a trial in Barcelona. Again, it's very personalized. Uh, here's a trial called Chiron, which is mainly open in the UK, uh, where again, it's selecting for those neoantigens that are unique to your cancer and um, treating patients with their own T cells. And here's a trial which is currently open in the US through Genosia, which is a um, Boston-based company. And in this case, they're doing the same thing, enriching your T cells for uh, recognition of those unique cancer mutations, only they're using peripheral blood instead of resecting it, removing a tumor by surgery. So the great thing about this is there ain't no surgery required. Uh, however, it's, it's still in its, uh, you know, first in human testing, you know, they just reported on the first four patients at AACR. So still in, a, um, in, still in its baby steps. So uh, I'm going to briefly go over the two genetically modified types of T cell therapy, and then I'm going to open it up for questions. So bear with me here. This is going to be a little dense. It's going to be a little bit um, heavy on the biology stuff. And I don't know about you guys, but I didn't do so well in biology in, in college. So <laughs> no, I'm kidding. So I, you know, I, I don't want to hammer you over the head with this stuff, but I do think it's important to kind of just get the landscape down. Yeah, because these are only going to become more prevalent over the next five to 10 years, these two types of trials, TCRs and CARs. So TCRs are genetically modified immune cells from our own body that are targeting a specific mutation. And before you ask, there hasn't been a single one yet targeting an elk, and that's really annoys me. <laughs> and when there is, believe me, I'll let you all know. But so far, these are targeting other cancer proteins. Um, they uh, are beautiful because you know exactly what they're targeting. You can test the tumor to see whether the tumor even expresses that target. And you can know since they're genetically changed, that you're actually giving a real potent cell therapy to a patient that, you know, it's very much targeting that. But the downside is, what if your tumor decides to stop expressing that target? Who, you know, well, that's not so good. You know, and also these are only available, this type of treatment for a select group of people that actually have that specific mutation. Plus, without getting in the weeds, there's a blood type requirement too. You need a specific HLA type, usually for each TCR. So an example is this abnormal tumor protein. We'll get into the details, but it's commonly expressed in sarcoma and it may very well be approved by the US FDA in the next couple of years for this sarcoma that expresses this protein. And we also have a trial in lung cancer, which Unfortunately, it's very rarely expressed in, in lung adenocarcinoma. So this trial is open and you can screen for it. You can send your tumor and you can send your blood to see whether or not you're a candidate for it. But the chances of being a positive are probably you know, less than 5%. So um, hopefully we'll have better targets, more appropriate for lung cancer in the next couple years, or maybe even the next couple months, because Neoantigens like KRAS, EGFR, ALK, those would be great targets for TCRs because your tumor has to express it in order for the tumor to be a tumor cell. Um, and so I'll go over that here briefly. Right now, there's several companies and the National Cancer Institute that are wielding this sword of TCRs for specific mutations. And for example, if you have a KRAS mutation, 
and you have this HLA type, as you can see on this book here, then there's a TCR for you. If you happen to have a P53 mutation and you have this HLA type, there's a TCR for you. So NeoGene, which is based in Netherlands, but has some sites in the US, and Alanos, which is based at MD Anderson, has these trials open, and the National Cancer Institute in Bethesda. And again, very similar to what I described, you have a screening process, you get, instead of a surgery, you just get a peripheral blood collection. Um, you have to, again, have the tumor target, and you also have to have the right HLA type. And this process takes a couple months, but um, after, if you wait around for two or three months, or maybe two months or less, maybe a month, depends on the trial, then you can get this um, chemotherapy followed by the infusion. So I'm really hoping that this becomes more prevalent and that we have one that actually targets ALK or ROS1 in the next couple of years. Because if we did, hey, look at all the people that could be eligible for it. And it's completely different from any treatment that we currently have available. It's nothing like Catruda or Optivo or Infinzi or Tecentric, and it's nothing like a TKI pill. This is the similar, you know, to the National Cancer Institute surgery branch. And um, I think I'll probably skip through a couple slides here. So this is just looking at P53. Um, but the truth is that there's other companies that are trying to look at, you know, cloning TCRs based on each individual patient's profile of mutations and then engineering a TCR for them. So like a personalized TCR. So far, this has been um, mainly just hampered by time. Like I said, it can take a lot of time to produce these. And I think this trial recently closed. So finally, um, you guys are becoming experts in cell therapy. I don't want to leave you without briefly talking about cars. And no, this is not um, a car show. This is more of a cell show. So basically, um, the great thing about cars is that they're easier to manufacture. You can donate your cells through that, through that blood draw or, or apheresis procedure. And a, a car can be manufactured pretty quickly in the course of 14 to 28 days. And there's no requirement to um, uh, restrict based on some certain things. But the downside is it can only target abnormal proteins that are present on the cell surface. So it has to actually be expressed on the tumor cell's surface in order for a car to work. So that's a big drawback because the truth is there ain't too many proteins that are unique to a tumor that are actually present on the cell surface. Whoops. Well, you know, what are some of the proteins that we can go after? Um, and it turns out, maybe you see this graph, that almost all the companies out there are really focusing heavy on cars because they've been approved by the US FDA for leukemia, lymphoma. But so far, nothing really has had dramatic uh, successes in, in solid tumors. So unfortunately, I think, you know, industry is throwing a lot of money at cars and their development, but it's still very much in its, um, like it still really hasn't passed the 100 yard line of the, of the mile race. And, you know, I think this is just briefly showing that, you know, these blood cancers are showing a lot of promise and activity with CAR T cells. And maybe there has been some, some small successes with CAR T cells like mesophilin CARs in mesothelioma or, or other cancers, but many of them uh, have not really found a lot of success. And the key thing for you guys to keep in mind is that these first in human trials, they rarely get published by industry. Yeah, so, you know, it gets, it gets done, there's too much toxicity or there's a problem and no responses or, you know, the stability of the marker or the, the problem with the manufacturing. And then, you know, the company may get acquired or sold or got a business. And then of course it doesn't get published or made, 
necessarily public data release. And so then there's another company that comes along after the same target and says, well, our technology might be a little better. Let's, let's do this. So it's a very frustrating world for us that, you know, we're trying to make some progress, but at the same time, there's been a lot of um, kind of repetitive um, drawbacks. And again, which target to go after with CAR T cells? Like I said, they can only use the cell surface markers. So picking amongst these, you know, narrow library of markers is not easy. One idea is this marker, which tries to select for tumor cells. And so maybe you'll, you'll won't have quite as much toxicity because one of the big disadvantages to going after some of these markers is you get off tumor on target side effects where the T cell decides to attack normal cells in, instead of or in addition to the tumor. And when that happens, it's big trouble because you patients, some patients have even died from that type of side effect. So any case, um, we're still very, I think cars in the long run will end up eclipsing or passing some of these other types of cell therapy, but that probably will take at least five, maybe even 10 years. So in conclusion, um, you know, we can see durable responses to TIL and lung cancer. And this seems like it's agnostic to pdl one or smoking or tumor mutation burden. And recombinant TCRs are really promising if you happen to have one of these public mutations that are common, like KRAS or uh, a, what's one that are actually present in that library. And there are, of course, practical logistics, challenging aspects to all of these types of cell therapy trials. So with that, I just want to thank our entire team across the US that has made some of these trials and some of this research data possible, uh, including um, you know, Stand Up to Cancer Foundation for funding our, our original uh, clinical trial. And of course, uh, thank you for hosting this um, event. I really appreciate um, being able to talk about this and to me, it's one of the most exciting things. It's kind of like a fifth pillar of cancer treatment. Thank you so much, Dr. Freeland. Um, so just taking a, a look at some of the questions that we have coming through, um, uh, maybe if, if you could start, we had one about sort of, how do you know which variant you are? And um, maybe you can sort of expand that to, yes. Are there kind of specific types of pretesting that might be helpful um, to sort of understand, you know, which type of, of therapy or trial might be might be right for a specific patient? So as as many of us have seen, if you have, I think if you're if you have the chance, try to get next generation sequencing done on your tumor. A lot of us with ELK, I'm just gonna say us because I feel like we're a community. Um, we get a fish test as our initial test, which shows that we're ALK positive, or we may get immunohistochemistry, which is fine. It's, it comes back faster than next-gen sequencing, actually. And some most patients can't afford to wait too long. So great. Uh, but some people, of course, get started, but we never actually do any next-generation sequencing on their tumor. So if you can, ask your doctor and say, hey, did I have next generation sequencing done, yes or no? And if not, can you still run it? Um, you know, the insurance company may very well pay for it. Um, just doing ELK fish or ELK IHC doesn't tell you what variant you are. Only next generation sequencing will do that. And sometimes it takes a little bit of digging to kind of figure out where which variant it is by reading through the report. That's how to find out. The other great thing about next generation sequencing is that you can know your co-mutations, other mutations in your tumor, which may play a role in the future in your treatment. For example, P53. There is um, a signal that patients with P53 mutations, their cancer may grow faster than the average one. It may 
be a little bit more aggressive. But did I just show you the P53 TCR that are available? If you have a P53, then there might be a TCR out there for you in the future. In general, these type of cell therapy trials are not tried and true. They are early phase. And so I think it's important to, you know, try to turn over all the cards that you can as you're playing this game. You're still holding your holding your cards, you're not playing any, but you want to know, you know, all the information possible. That's why I advocate and next gen sequencing if possible. Um, and then we have some questions about sort of uh, how would auto, uh, autoimmune conditions impact this type of treatment, um, or you know maybe you could also just talk a little bit about uh, the protocol for for these trials um, and what you know someone who is potentially joining a trial could could expect. Yeah, so most of these trials will. I'm sorry, I. I, I was looking at the chat, actually, what, what, the, the question again, sorry, the, the person had, I'll, I'll talk about the eligibility. I think it was, how, how would an autoimmune condition impact yes, right. this type of treatment? Um, but so, yeah. yeah, so that's a good question. So in my view, autoimmune condition is kind of like a spectrum, right? It's like, you have the person who's like pretty normal over here, like you or I, and they could still get an autoimmune condition from cell therapy or immune checkpoint like Chikotruda or Alpivo. And then you have like maybe someone who has debilitating rheumatoid arthritis or scleroderma or some of these other type of severe autoimmune conditions they are on active immune suppressants. And even then it's poorly controlled. So that type of patient is almost certainly gonna end up being excluded from these type of cell therapies trials, just like just about every other immune checkpoint trial. But then there's the patients kind of in the middle where they, they've had, say, an episode in the past. Uh, they're not currently requiring immunosuppressive treatment. For that type of patient, they're probably going to be eligible. It really depends, though. And trying to just say autoimmune condition, some of them are much worse than others, right? In general, though, for the, the, the way we look at the eligibility is... We generally do require some pulmonary function tests in patients who are like on high levels of oxygen or requiring oxygen. It's often not a good idea for them because they're, you know, towards the middle of that treatment when it's really intense on, with the interleukin-2, they may very well be requiring oxygen while they're in the hospital there. So I think um, most of these studies currently are not letting patients who are currently requiring oxygen go on. And that's the most important eligibility standpoint for these trials. And of course, for TIL, you do need a tumor that is safe to remove by surgery. And that isn't everyone. So that's why, you know, for, for patients with brain metastases, generally we don't just want to do a brain surgery because of a trial. Um, but um, T cells do um, go through the, the blood brain barrier. Um, so the cell therapy has worked, in my experience, for patients with very small brain metastases. And then what are your thoughts, um, you know, so, so a lot of ALK patients, uh, as, as you know, are on uh, TKIs. Um, can you talk a little bit more about sort of some of the criteria? Do you have to go off your TKIs? Um, is it possible to potentially go back on them or remain on them during these, uh, these types of trials or treatments? Yeah, so that's a good question because most of us are reluctant as doctors to stop the, the pills because we know, you know if you're off the pill for a couple of weeks, that's a good chance the, pill, the cancer could start revving up again. So in, in our upcoming trial, we've designed it so that you just have to be off of it for about three days before you get your surgery. And if you, if you want to, you can restart the pill or if we think it's warranted, we can restart the pill while you're waiting for the cells to be made. But um, if you're in the middle of getting the cells, like with the lymphodepletion chemotherapy, the interleukin-2, you know, that's already having a lot of side effects with it. 
and the chemotherapy is already providing some pressure on the cancer cells to prevent them from growing. That's not their its purpose, but indirectly it does. So I wouldn't, I definitely wouldn't combine the TKIs with the treatment actively, perhaps again, um, uh, beforehand. And then you asked about restarting it afterwards. Well, you know, our, our patients, we haven't done that, right? The whole idea behind this is that it's a one-time treatment. That's what makes it, you know, beautiful. And having to do TKI afterwards, the whole idea is that you don't need to, to stay on the TKI. I would definitely not restart the TKI willy-nilly unless there was a signal that the tumor was starting to grow again. And we can follow CEA levels and CT scans every, you know, 12 or 15 weeks, et cetera, to, to, get, to get to that. Great. Um, and then a couple of questions about uh, the requirement for, um, you know, immunotherapy. Uh, and the, I think you mentioned the TILs from patients who have not yet had checkpoint inhibitors, uh, you know, do, uh, you mentioned sort of exhaustion and, and they tend to be more effective. Um, so then in some of the upcoming trials, you, uh, I think you said that those patients will still receive uh, a couple of cycles of a checkpoint inhibitor um, treatment. And can, can you maybe explain the rationale there? Uh, if, you know, checkpoint inhibitor therapy, um, the patients who, have, who are naive to that type of therapy actually seem to, to maybe do better. Um, why, you know, why is that still a requirement or why is that part of the, the protocol? Yeah, so let's just take a melanoma as a, because this is where that was first being developed and it's still you know, under review by the FDA now. So with TIL PD-1 naive patients, the Opdivo, Keytruda naive patients, the response rates were around 50%, 50%. The post Keytruda patients, it's around 38%. So it's, it's not like a dramatic difference, but it does seem to be a trend. And um, it does make sense from a immune basis that if you have like this T cell that's kind of been getting you know, stimulated continuously by an antibody, and then you tell it to like grow and flow it, copy itself like a hundred or thousand times, it's gonna be pretty um, terminally, it's gonna be kind of tired basically by the end of that. And um, I don't, uh, I can't really speak to the, the specifics there because we just don't, we're still trying to discover more about that. It doesn't mean it's not worth trying, um, but you know, if, if I had my choice, I would prefer to do it earlier. Got it. And I think you mentioned this, but um, if the cancer is in other places beside the lung, um, do, do you find that, or in theory, should sort of till or any kind of cellular therapy work um, sort of a, across the body? Um, yes. So the, the key question is whether the, the tumor in the bone or the liver, if it still expresses those mutations that are recognized by the T cells, then it should also work there. And um, same as the way a TKI or a pill should work everywhere when you first start it. Um, although, like I showed a few of those slides, occasionally we can see some resistant tumors appear that lack the original proteins. And that's a, a problem. Um, just like we see resistance to these pills, we can see resistance to, to T cells too. And um, like you say, um, I think I'm not looking at Michael Hughes' question. So with the CARS, um, you're right. There's other problems with targeting the, the proteins that are inside the cell because the tumor has to use something called HLA to present them. So one of the ways that some viruses or bacteria get around our immune system is by preventing our cells from expressing HLA. And if you can't express the HLA, then the protein ain't seen and the tumor cell gets away. It's like um, jamming the radar of the police. So indeed, many tumors can stop expressing HLA and then uh, that's shown as a resistance um, thing that still needs to be overcome. 
However, um, you know, elk fusions, um, there is researchers, as we know, that are currently trying to find T cells that are targeting elk fusions. I think it's been slow because there's few patients. And um, nonetheless, I'm still I'm always checking for this. And um, I think we we did see that you've had, you know, maybe a couple of elk patients. Um, I think one in particular, there was uh, sort of a video that was released. Um, and, you know, he was he was treated with, I believe, some sort of, of cellular therapy. Uh, and it sounds like, you know, that individual did have a durable response. Um, anything in general you can you can share with us on sort of some of the efficacy maybe you've seen in, in outpatients specifically of these types of therapies? Yeah. Oh, no, no. The, the truth is that that patient, um, he did, uh, he was enrolled in the trial. He had his tumor harvested and he started Opdivo. And actually he's still in remission on the Opdivo and we just have the T cells ready to go. It's very strange because we don't usually expect elk to respond to Opdivo, but Looking back after we removed the tumor, we did PDL1 on it and it was 100%. And um, his, his, he had a lot of T cells inside that tumor. And, and they were like, you know, interestingly, they were, they were mostly CD8 cells, which, so, so any case, the, it's, a, it's a very strange case. And that's about, I think, all I can say about it. But yeah, the, the, as you can see, if you look at our publication, um, you know, he actually has not received it yet. So nonetheless, um, I'm still thinking that since the biology of, you know, the immune system of patients with EGFR and, and other cancers are similar to ELK, um, I would expect that you could see some responses with ELK, just the same as with EGFR. And especially since you know, you know, like chemotherapy, we know that the remissions can last often for months and not likely to last for years with chemotherapy, um, especially with some of the other, even, even with elk, honestly, sometimes, you know, you're talking about 10 months after getting chemo. And I think it's definitely an intriguing option or a, it's more of a high risk, but high reward type of treatment for patients to consider as, you know, they go through all these different treatments. Um, and we do have some, uh, some, some friends in the community who are based in Europe and elsewhere. Um, any sort of planned trials that you're aware of, or maybe you can talk more generally about kind of availability, um, you know, of, of some of the trials that you mentioned and, and where they're located? Yeah, so um, I believe the, the IOVANCE trials may be open in, in Europe, for example, in Spain or in um, possibly in Switzerland. So I believe that Dr. Kukos at uh, the Lausanne in, in near Geneva um, has plans to open a trial for TIL in lung cancer. And also at Netherlands Cancer Institute, Dr. Hainan, I believe has, has different TCR or T cell type trials uh, include enrolling lung cancer. And in addition, um, the, let's see, for, so for lung cancer, um, that trial I, I had a slide on at Hebron in um, Barcelona, I believe just opened a few months ago. So that's that personalized T-cell approach. There's um, T-cell trials in China, which I'm less familiar with, but they are, um, they are target doing TCR trials in China, I believe. And Currently, there's no trials for TIL in for lung cancer at Sheba in Israel, but um, they do have other tumor types that they're doing there. Mm, I'm sure I'm leaving some stuff out here, but this is just what's, what comes to mind. And maybe just for um, Moffitt, since you're obviously you know, most familiar there. Um, how, how can patients, you know, learn more or if they're interested in potentially enrolling in a trial or finding out more, what, what's the best way to, to, to get in touch? Well, um, we have a ICE-T program, immune cellular therapy program. It's an entire department just for this. 
there's social workers, there's classes, there's, um, you know, clinical trial coordinators, nurses, doctors that are just do this. So I would say reaching out, I can provide an email for the, specifically for clinical trials, um, but definitely setting up a new patient visit is a, a good, good first step as well, potentially. Great. Um, and then, um, so a question here about, you know, if, uh, if someone re acquires resistance to a TKI, um, and you know, there are kind of subsequent, um, there's, there's sort of a path, right? Like typically you'll start on sort of a first generation or second generation, and then, you know, you might go to kind of a third or now they're developing fourth and fifth generation TKIs. Um, any thoughts on sort of would you potentially try TIL or some kind of cellular therapy before actually progress, before moving on to, um, you know, whatever sort of the subsequent TKI is that, that you would normally uh, start taking after progression? Well, if, so for starters, if I was on a, a TKI and I had a new tumor growing, if the trial allowed me, I would try to get it removed, right? Okay, getting rid of the tumor and then banked and saved for till. That would be great because that way I'm getting the tumor taken care of. I'm staying on my pill and I'm just, you know, the, the trial could potentially just be arc keeping it in a frozen that cells frozen somewhere so that if I were to progress, then I'd have that available. That being said, I do think it's important for patients to, you know, get as much mileage as they can out of their their TKI pills, because those are tried and true options for, for what they have. And I wouldn't necessarily, for example, if you're progressing on, you know, electinib or, and, and there's a good shot that the labrina might work or things like that, I might be, you know, smarter to kind of stick with that, knowing that as we can see, you can sometimes get years out of your second or third um, pill. On the other hand, if you have like variant three, and your first pill only lasted you, you know, six months or eight months or something crazy, then in that case, I would say it's probably smarter to get on trying something else in addition to that than sooner than later. So it depends on the context. That's kind of a cop-out answer, I'll admit. But, <laughs> you know, I, I certainly think that the, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't gainsay all the progress we've had with TKIs when really the cell therapy is still much, it's kind of, again, in this baby steps. Got it. Um, and then quickly, can you use an older tumor? Uh, if you have older tumor tissue uh, for, for some of these trials, is kind of new or better? Can you use, you know, older tissue, um, you know, if, uh, uh, if maybe, I guess, if you've already progressed, but also, you know, even in a situation where maybe you have some, you know, tissue from a year ago and you haven't progressed. Um, any thoughts on on when it's sort of best to, um, or what type of tissue is is most helpful? Looks so, like um, always has to be fresh tumor for till. <laughs> yeah, so you can imagine like that we're we're taking live cells from from something if it's been fixed in formalin and sitting in it, you know, on the shelf for a year. All those all the everything in there is completely dead. So. Um, Yep, so it does have to be collected fresh for till. There is um, uh, certain trials where, where we do collect your blood, like the TCR trial or the CAR-T or the peripheral blood, like Genosia one I mentioned, where they can use old tumor from a year, two, three, four years ago and test that way, right? But we still need to get live cells that are peripheral blood cells in that case, right? Got it. Um, great. Well, maybe, uh, so, so last thing, um, how can this community help you accelerate all the great work that you're doing? Oh, good question. Well, um, I think, you know, once we have, um, this trial open, uh, it could be a, a good option again for patients that have kind of just plain exhausted all the, uh, TKIs that they've, they've, um, tried and, We've been patients that have progressed on chemotherapy before or other chemotherapies. So that's that would be a great um, 
uh, collaboration to have. Um, and also just, I think that have for me as a physician, having this forum available to give to patients so that they become more educated about their disease is just incredibly helpful. So thank you for just continuing to, to spread the word and doing serving as advocacy for, for what we do and, and making our jobs that much easier. Thank, thank you. you so much. Well, um, one last question, sorry to uh, jump in. I know we're run, running out of time, but um, how much tissue do you need was one of the last questions. Um, so uh, usually it requires like a, a surgical biopsy. Like if I have a lymph node on my neck, it needs to be cut out. Or if I have a little lung nodule, like a centimeter lung nodule, it needs to be cut out. Just doing a plain old core biopsy uh, for most of the trials isn't enough. Is it enough material? We are trying, we've been doing a few trials with just doing a biopsy and it's still again in its early phases. But um, the, the more tissue, the better. Not only that, but again, you can send that tumor tissue for next generation sequencing. You can find out more about your resistance mutation. And so that, that tumor tissue does not go to waste. It also can serve as archival tissue or old tissue for future trials if you end up needing another trial later on. Um, in my view, honestly, if a patient's newly diagnosed, getting a simple surgical biopsy, the same day procedure, is actually preferred to me than doing a biopsy because I can get much more tumor material and I can use that for all sorts of stuff throughout the course of their cancer. It really is a uh, an important or, or helpful thing. Right. And roughly yeah. how long are uh, tissue samples viable? Is it hours, days, weeks? Well, interestingly, so cells um, were recently shown that you can freeze, a, put a cell in liquid nitrogen, like these TIL, T cells, and they can still be used um, 20 years later. So I think there was a recent study that was just a few days ago that was in the news that showed that myeloma cells were thawed from 30 years ago and they were given to a patient and they're still usable, they're still worked fine because the cells are basically, you know, they're, they're frozen, like a very deep, low temperature. As far as the tumors for sequencing or other things, usually pathology departments are required by the College of American Pathology to keep the tumor for at least 15 years on the shelf. And most academic centers will keep the tumor for 20 or 30 years, you know, the, the, they don't really get rid of them much. Um, so chances are, if you had tumor removed 10 or 15 years ago, it's still there. Great. I'm sure you see all the, the thank yous coming through, but um, I think we do this. Maybe everyone can unmute themselves and we can just give, give Dr. Creelan a uh, a, a thank you. Um, but, but this is great. Thank you so much for your time. I think thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much. Everybody. We'll thank see everyone so back here on the 15th of April is our next talk. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Creelan, so much. Thank you so much. Sunday. 15th of May. <laughs> if the meal man. Thanks, Carla, so much. Yes, and thank you. Summer. Thank you, everyone.